say thank you to our mothers who are here with us today. Uh, this is one of the, the great days of the year when we get to honor those who've done so much for us. And as you leave today, if all of you mothers would take a moment either to come by where Terry will be standing in the back or where I will be standing, we will have a little, just a small token, a small gift for each of you mothers. We just want to be able to say from the Valley View congregation that we love you and we're grateful. We're grateful for all that our mamas do for us as we walk this life. You know, when we think about what it means to be a child and to grow up and under mama's love and care, there's a lot of things that are unique to children. And they don't just occur during the years of our childhood and adolescence. They continue on into life. But as a child, I, I remember I like to trade things with my friends. Usually for me, it was sports cars. That was what was big when I was a kid. When my parents were young, people would trade marbles. That never seemed too appealing to me in my day, but you know, years ago, kids would trade marbles back and forth. Now it's Pokemon cards. If you don't know what that is, don't bother. You don't want to, okay? But they, they like to trade these little cards now. Kids have always liked to make trades with one another. And I remember my mama used to always try to give me advice, make sure you make good trades. And sometimes I'd trade something and she'd say, now you're going to take that back and you're going to get back what you gave him because that wasn't a good trade. Mom always wanted me to make a, a good trade. And I guess we, that kind of sticks with us because some of y'all like to go and trade cars because you got a new one every other year, you know. And others of you like to go to auctions and make trades. So that, that kind of survives with us throughout life. But it starts in childhood. And one thing that kind of struck me as we were looking forward to this Mother's Day was my mama made trades too. Every mother makes trades. She trades her sleep at night to hold a crying baby all night long sometimes. Doesn't she? That's a trade. Sometimes a mama will, will trade her you know, security and, and just sense of well-being as she worries for her children and stays up late waiting for them when they go on their first date or out in a car for the first time. A mama will trade her time to sit through ball game after ball game after ball game, even if her son is the last one off the bench and doesn't get two minutes of playing time in the whole game. She will trade, you know, her, her, her sense of honesty to tell him that no matter how he did, he did, he was the best one. And he absolutely was a champion. Mamas make all kinds of trades. And most of them, if you were to look at them simply from a perspective of selfishness, from a mama's sense of perspective, you might say, she doesn't make very good trades. Because almost always those trades are sacrificial. As she gives up something of her own, of herself, for the sake of those that she loves. You know, when we consider that angle, that perspective, that tells us a lot about Jesus. And I don't know about you, but when I was a, a child, and as I look back, and we, we've talked a lot about memories this weekend. My daughter graduated yesterday, and we were going through and reminiscing, and we watched videos of, of when the kids were little, and, and my mom holding the kids as babies, and my dad there, and, and just kind of going through a little trip of nostalgia. And as you think of those things, you know, you go back and, and you remember all of the sacrifices that were made and you realize, you know, mom and dad, in many ways, really did mirror the life of Jesus and the type of sacrificial giving that he offered to each and every one of us. You see, Jesus made a lot of trades too. We don't ever see in Scripture him trading his donkey for a new one. He wasn't a, you know, a barter, a dealer in first century business terms. In fact, the scriptures tell us that he, the Son of Man doesn't even have a place to lay his head. He didn't have anything to trade physically in this life. But indeed, being the Son of God, God in the flesh, who came to this earth, 
Jesus made a number of trades. And if you were to look at them from the perspective of what was good for him, you would think that Jesus is the worst trader that has ever lived. But then when you look at them from the perspective of what was good for us, you realize that he's a savior. The first thing we see is that Jesus, Jesus traded and took a human mother so that we could have a divine father. Now we don't think of it that way, but it indeed was a swap. It was a trade. Because he had lived eternally with a divine father. Jesus had lived throughout the ages of time and since the very beginning. He had no beginning. He had no end. He lived with the Father in perfection all throughout the ages of time. But we, we were born in humanity in all of its frailness and all of its weakness. And Jesus offered for us what He had. And to do that, He took what we have. He took a, an earthly, a human mother so that we can have a divine father. Philippians chapter 2, starting verse 5 down through about verse 8. The scripture describes this in great detail. As it tells us that we should have the same mind in us that was in Christ Jesus. Who did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Some versions say, who did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped. We sing it this way. He left the splendors of heaven, knowing his destiny. And then it says, and made himself nothing. Taking on the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. So it explains for us there that Jesus came to this earth. He traded. In some ways, he emptied. I don't fully understand exactly how all that works. But I know the Greek word is kanuo, which basically means the emptying. Now, Jesus was indeed God in the flesh. He was indeed the Son of God on this earth. But there was a sense in which when he took on humanity and became man as well as God, that he emptied himself of some of that divinity, of some of that power, of some of that awesomeness. He made a trade. He gave up something to come to this earth and live as a man, to take a human mother. And then knowing his destiny, it tells us in verse 8, and having been found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself even to the point of death, yea, even the death of a cross. So coming to this earth, he knew his destiny from the very first moment. We look over at Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. And the Hebrew writer will explain it in this way. It says, Inasmuch as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who has the power over death, that is, the devil. It says he partook of flesh and blood in the same exact way that we partake of it. In other words, he was human in every way. Now that doesn't diminish the fact that he was deity in every way. He was indeed both. Now that doesn't make a lot of sense from our perspective, but the scriptures are clear. Jesus was 100% God. He was 100% man. And there was a specific purpose for which he made this from one perspective absolutely horrible trade. Because in John chapter 1, John chapter 1 and verse 12, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in His name. The most beloved verse in all the New Testament explains it quite well. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son so that whosoever believes in Him would not perish 
but have eternal life. He came to this earth so God could be our father. He traded and took on a human mother so that we could have a divine father. From one perspective, if you look at what Christ got out of the exchange, it wasn't a very good bargain indeed. But when we look at it from the vantage point of forgiven sinners, it was the bargain of the century. He took a human mother so we could have a divine father. Second thing that's an interesting trade is 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. Paul tells us, For you know that grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that you through His poverty might become rich. He makes a bargain here. He makes a trade, if you will. Jesus was rich. Well, that isn't even an appropriate word. I mean, it's the closest thing we have, but it doesn't capture the fullness of His riches. He was the Creator. Through Him all things were made that have been made. It says in the book of Colossians. That means He didn't just have everything. He could wish it into existence and He had everything. There were no limitations on His might and His power and His possessions. So yes, indeed He was rich. But it says, but for your sake, He became poor so that we might possess His riches. When you think about all that that means, when you think about the riches that have been poured upon us in Christ Jesus, you see that Jesus indeed, He made a trade. He made a trade so that He would take on poverty. And that doesn't just mean the poverty of humanity. I guess in its fullness, He took on the, the most impoverished humanity imaginable. He was born in a stable. Now, I know we, we say manger. And that gets, you know, kind of whitewashed for the Christmas crowd. We don't ever walk into a nativity scene and smell what you smell in a stable, do you? I mean, when you walk into those beautiful nativity, they're all lit so well. And the manger, which is the feeding trough that they put him in, it doesn't look much like a feeding trough. It doesn't look, you know, these days like any animal's ever eaten out of it. In fact, it is pearly white. It is clean. It is sterilized even. And that's to put the, 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 you know, the toy baby doll in. Much less a, a real live baby. That's not where Jesus was born. He was born in a stable with animals in poverty. He was born to parents who had very little. And he would grow up just a common man in a backwards place. I don't know what we could equate to Nazareth, but I know this, that the, that the, this is going to, I know, it, no matter what I illustrate here, it's going to offend somebody, so I'm just going to apologize in advance. But you know, Nazareth, that would be kind of like how we looked at a few of the town names when we moved to Arkansas, you know, Goober Town, Bald Knob. Possum grape? I mean, wouldn't you think that people, you know, in Little Rock who are working in the high rises or in Memphis working in the high rises, when, when they would say, you know, some new attorney or, or doctor moves to town and they say, where is he from? Well, he's just moved here from Possum Grape. You know what they're going to say? Well, can anything good come out of Possum Grape? You know, that's what they said about Jesus. Didn't they? You remember? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He came from a backward place. Little town. Nowhere. He was born to a common family in obscurity. He didn't just take on the poverty of humanity in general. He took on the most impoverished poverty of humanity. 
so that we could be children of God, so that we could have a mansion over the hilltop that awaits us, so that we could walk on streets of gold beside a crystal sea. He made a trade. He took our poverty so that we could have His riches. Thirdly, He endured our temptation so that we could have a merciful high priest. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, the Hebrew writer describes this for us by saying, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but with all in all points he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Therefore let us come boldly through the throne, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in our time and help in our time of need. So it tells us Jesus, he endured temptation. And folks, I don't think we fully understand the fullness of this. It says he was tempted in every point, just as we are. Now, we may want to try to find a, an easier understanding of that, because that's hard to wrap our minds around. Here's the hard part. He was tempted in every point, but without sin. Now, let me explain temptation. Temptation just doesn't mean that he was presented with the opportunity to do wrong. That is not the full meaning of temptation. You know how I know that? Because you could be presented with the opportunity to do wrong and you would have no desire to do it. And that's not temptation. I mean, there are some things that tempt this old boy, okay? But there are some things that don't. You can lock me in this auditorium for the next month with a, a full vial of illicit drugs, heroin or something. And I'm telling you, I, I, I'm not going to shoot up. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't have any desire. I've seen it destroy too many people's lives. I've never been hooked on that. Never even experienced it ever. And I don't ever want to experience it. You know? So I'm not going to be tempted by that. I am not tempted by that. Now there are things that I am tempted by, but not that. You see, just having the opportunity to do wrong is not the biblical definition of temptation. James chapter 1 tells us the biblical definition of temptation. Starting in verse 10, it says, For no one should say when he is tempted that I am tempted by God. Remember that? For God cannot be tempted, nor does he tempt others. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own, some versions say lust, other versions say desire. And when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. That means you can't be tempted without desire. Putting it in simple language. To be tempted by something, you have to, or at least part of you, has to want to do it. I mean, isn't that true? You ever been tempted by anything that part of you didn't want to do? I don't mean all of you. You wouldn't be able to resist if all of you wanted to. But I mean, at least part of you had a desire. That's temptation. That means that Jesus was tempted. The same Bible that describes it that way says Jesus was tempted. In every point, just as we are. Really imagine what that means. That means every day He had that same, not just opportunity, but desire. That means when the Pharisees tried to mock him and make him look silly in front of the, his followers and Jesus got upset. He really wanted to call down a lightning bolt and fry him right there. Do you have any doubt that Jesus wanted to do that at times? He didn't, but do you have any doubt that he wanted to? And we could talk about the whole myriad of different types of temptation. The Bible says he was tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet, he did not sin. The other thing that really brings this into perspective is Jesus had to be the perfect sacrifice, the sinless sacrifice to be acceptable as a trade for our sins. 
I don't know about you, but temptation doesn't just come once a month for this old human being. And it doesn't usually just come once a week. When you factor in all of the temptation to lose your temper, when you shouldn't, when you factor in all the temptation to have a thought that you shouldn't have or to treat someone in a way that you shouldn't or to be selfish when you shouldn't be selfish or whatever it may be, how often does temptation rear its ugly head in your life? Weekly? Daily? Hourly? However it is for you, it was equally so for him. Yet he never sinned. You heard the expression, I feel like I have the weight of the world on my shoulders. Jesus literally did. And I mean, it wasn't just in the decision, am I going to go to the cross or not, when he cried in the garden. And he said, Lord, if there be any way, let this cup pass from me. He didn't just save us in that decision. He saved us in every decision, every day, every hour of his life. When he chose to do right over the desire to do wrong, he saved us again and again and again and again. Because one misstep, and he wouldn't have been the sacrifice anymore. So, what kind of trade did he make? He made the trade that he would take on our temptations so that we can have salvation through a merciful high priest. Temptations frustrating. It's frustrating because of that factor of human desire and we would like not to have the desire so we're not tempted but that's not the way it works in life i heard about a, an old preacher who he preached for a large congregation and another young man came in kind of as his protege and he was going to follow in his footsteps and he was talking to the young man about temptation and how he needed to you know live his life in a way that that you know limited his opportunities to be tempted Especially when it came to relationships with folks in the church and, and, and ladies and things of that nature. And this young man said, well, I've got the key, brother. He said, I, I figured this out. He said, I just don't ever be alone with a young lady. He said, I found that there's safety in numbers. And the wise old preacher looked at him and said, well, there's safety in numbers, but there's more safety in exodus. Now think about that. And his point was, is that, you know, the only way you're going to get away from temptation is not just being safety in numbers, but you need to get away from it. Jesus suffered that same reality of temptation and he willingly took it on for our sake. The fourth thing that Jesus traded is he took our sins so that we can have His righteousness. You see, in 2 Corinthians 5, 20, 21, it says, For God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that we might become His righteousness. It says that He traded His righteousness for our sin. That's what the cross is. The cross is an exchange. The cross is where God takes and nails our sins to it. So that now it tells us in Galatians chapter 3, 27, all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. He looked upon Jesus on the cross and he saw not his perfection. He saw our imperfection. That's why he turned away from him and punished that sin. And Jesus cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus knew the answer. It was a rhetorical question. God had forsaken him because Jesus was no longer Jesus in his perfection. He was Carrie and he was Jesse and he was Marty. He took on our sin. 
So that now when I'm baptized into Christ and have been clothed with Christ, when He looks upon Jesse and Carrie and Marty, He doesn't see the, the filth and the weakness of Jesse, Carrie and Marty. He sees that with which we've been covered. He sees Jesus. He made an exchange. He made a trade. And of course we see that we now experience purity because of that exchange. You know, we could go on and list so many things that Jesus gave up. Trades that Jesus made for our sake. But I think we would all agree that if you were to have looked at these exchanges through selfish eyes, if you were to even have, have done an, an evaluation of what was good for him? What was most beneficial? What made sense? What was reasonable? He would have determined. I'm getting the worst end of each of these bargains. But yet he chose to take a human mother so we could have a divine father. He chose to leave heaven for earth so that we could Leave earth for heaven. He chose the cross. He chose death so that we could have life. <coughs> Jesus made trades for you. This morning, as we think back upon our mamas who sacrificed so much, and the fact that they learned that ability from Jesus, and as we contemplate all that He's given up for us, I ask you simply this morning, what have you given up for Him? He won't ever ask of you all that He's given. He'll ask you to give of yourself. He'll ask you to commit to Him, give Him your life, but He'll always give you more in return than you're ever asked to offer. So this morning, when you think about all those exchanges, when you think about all the riches you've been given and all the poverty it cost Him for you to have, how's your relationship with Jesus? Do you need to make a change? Do you need to come to Him, repent of your sins, confess His name, be baptized? Or have you drifted away from that? And do you need to return? <laughs> if so, don't delay. Come right now as we stand as we sing.